afternoon. And welcome to CyberFest 20, the Northeast's biggest cybersecurity festival. My name is Phil Jackman and I lead on Cyber North, the region's cybersecurity cluster, developed by Dynamo Northeast and supported by Accenture and the Innovation Super Network. We're working to support the region as a great place to deliver cybersecurity services. CyberFest, now in its third year, shows the breadth of talent and expertise that the industry has to offer in the region, and also the wide and often complicated facets that contribute to cybersecurity. So this is the sixth of 11 events that we have this September, this time with our colleagues at Newcastle College, looking at getting people into the industry. It's estimated that there are around three and a half million job vacancies in cybersecurity across the globe, and we want some of them right here in the region. So we've got a great lineup of speakers. If you'd like to raise questions, please can use the Q&A button uh, on your screens, and I'll try and get through as many as we can. Those we can't, we'll look to respond to in writing. Thank you. Can I ask then either Andy Nicholson, if he's about Head of Digital Technologies at Newcastle College, uh, to come on. If not, we'll go with Matt, who's the program leader for the networking and cybersecurity degrees at the college. Thank you, sir. I, I don't think we've got Andy, so I'm just going to do the introduction for the college. Um, so, hi, I'm Matt Sessions. I'm the program leader for the networking and cybersecurity degrees that we deliver here at the college. I just want to say, take this opportunity to say thank you for everyone joining us today and hopefully you enjoyed the talks that have been set up. That's great. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so our first speaker is Steve Goulet from Thumble, sorry, Newcastle Building Society. I nearly promoted you there or something, Steve. So, so good friend of mine from Newcastle Building Society. Hello, Steve. How are you? Good afternoon, Phil. Hopefully you can hear me okay. We can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, got a couple of short slides just to go through an uh, interest in a career in cybersecurity. Hopefully you've read my biography. Um, I'm head of IT risk for Newcastle Building Society. I look after um, the information security team uh, as well. Um, and what I want to cover today is just um, a little bit on, on getting a role and then once you've got that role just developing into that role. Um, so it's got about 10 minutes um, and hopefully some time uh, for questions at the end and uh, as Phil says the, the chat functionality is there and you can, you can raise your hand as well if you want to ask any questions. We'll go straight in to the first slide. So why cyber? Um, Phil touched on it there in the introduction. Um, most experts and studies conclude that there's a widening skills gap in cybersecurity. So that means, that means a couple of things. It means that unemployment will be relatively low in this sector, um, close to zero, if you believe some, some people. And also the rules of supply and demand mean that your skills will be in demand. Uh, and obviously that has an impact on the, the salary that you can command as well. So, so a pretty good, good start to a career. Um, it's interesting and varied. I used to always say to colleagues when I used to drive to work because I'm, I'm home based at the moment. You never knew what you were driving into. Every day was different. Interesting. It's certainly not a nine to five job. Um, it's an opportunity to, to mix planned work, you know, the usual projects, meetings, that sort of thing. With unplanned work, there will always be incidents and uh, uh, things like that, which which, which keep the role interesting and then um, every day is absolutely different. Uh, I can promise you that. For job advertisements, so this, this is just a little bit of a warning really. Um, often they ask for skills and experience and, and I often say that these are unrealistic for the, for the level of the role. So the advice is apply anyway. Um, and you know, we've seen examples where, um, you know, we want 10 years experience in product X when product X has only been around for sort of seven or eight years. So quite often the teams that are placed in the adverts might not understand, fully understand the, the requirements. Um, after the application, certifications can really help you to differentiate yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, but plan these carefully. Some of the certifications require many years experience to be demonstrated as well as passing an exam to prove your knowledge. So things like CISP is, might, might be something that you attain to, but uh, just be aware of, of the, um, the, 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 
the knowledge and experience requirement as well as well as that you need a keenness and a willingness to continually learn and stay up to date i think in this profession more than any other if you qualify as a as a solicitor or an accountant your your body of knowledge is relatively static um, you need to keep up with the latest um, laws and, 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 and regulations and that sort of thing but with cyber security really when you come back from a two-week holiday your knowledge can start to be out of date you need to be absolutely bang on the money all the time so we spend a lot of time just continually learning um, just going back to the previous point on certifications i'm still um, 25 years into the career still looking at certifications and how i can better myself and how i can keep my knowledge current um, when, when the threats and things are changing all of the time so we have a very broad knowledge base you need to invest in yourself keep your knowledge up to date if you get an interview almost certainly the interviewers will ask you about your about incidents that are in the media media at the minute so perhaps uh, an organization has suffered a, a cyber breach or something like that or perhaps there's a there's a vulnerability that's been in the press as well uh, when we say vulnerabilities these days they seem to have quite fancy names like drown and heartbleed and, and shell shock and that sort of thing so keep your knowledge up to date and be, be able to answer questions upon it uh, the next point is around risk I mean th this is about risk management you need to understand and be able to demonstrate uh, an awareness of risk and what is and sometimes that involves translating non um, technical terms into, into non-technical terms depending on your audience for coming into the cyber profession I, i've seen some of some of my team members and, and colleagues in previous roles uh, come into cyber security from IT and I've also some seen them come in from a non-IT background for example from an auditor or a compliance uh, in my experience it's easier to come into cyber security from an IT background um, than an IT background but um, don't let that put you off if you get the opportunity to work in an IT department uh, perhaps starting out in a service desk role or a desktop support role um, try and move around the different areas of IT um, and that will get you a good grounding in all, in all areas so that you can focus then on security um, afterwards. Uh, the next point is just around, you know, I've put post COVID. So at the minute, the majority of, of people I know, both in, in my organization and, and the wider business, North, Northeast businesses, are working remotely and from home. So if you had a desire to work locally, is that still valid? Do you, are you going to, are you going to, limit your search to organizations who are only based in the northeast if you're home working anyway you may be able to widen that search out and open up some some further opportunities and i don't think getting the role would be complete without looking at just generic expectations which you, you which really you should you should be on top of for any role in which you apply for be on time plan your day prepare in advance sometimes consider those soft skills that, you, that you've got as well written and verbal language in this day and age are extremely important and as important as the technical or rule specific skills that's just a few points on getting the role um, so you've got the role now and how do we develop in it so i think you should have a goal of where you want to be and how long that's going to take you um, it's, it's no use just plodding from job to job and you know you should have it you know do you want to be a CISO eventually do you want to specialize in in forensics do you want to be a pen tester it'd be good to have to have a goal where you eventually want to be mentors are important um, when you're on board with some organizations um, as early talent or apprentice some some organizations will nominate um, a mentor for you um, but in, in my experience official and unofficial mentors somebody to take you under your wing and, and look after you and, and take the time out of their day to teach you and to show you um, is extremely important in terms of training we can't expect formal training for everything formal training training courses tend to be fairly expensive um, and there's a lot of free content out there available on the internet and um, i've put some of them down now I'll, I'll not repeat them but there's a lot of free quality training where you can you can self teach it um, and that i've found a lot of good experience um, and knowledge is just to be gained that way um, 
and buy some books as well. You can buy books on Amazon uh, very cheaply and some, some used books as well. So I've always got a huge stack of books inside of my desk, if, um, as anyone who knows us will attest to. Um, and at home now, I must, have, uh, I must have a dozen books there at the side just to pick up. Um, so that gives you some time away from the screen as well. Uh, be patient with regards to progression, um, especially if you're in a role with a good employer who's training you and giving you really good experience. Um, there will be opportunities elsewhere. Um, as, you, as, you, as you go further into career, you will be contacted by recruitment agencies and things like that, uh, dangling the carrot and trying to get you to, to go to another organisation where perhaps you think the grass is greener. But if you're getting good experience and, and, and training and, and certifications, uh, don't don't jump too early just for a small increase. Look at look at the bigger picture on the longer term and try and uh, try and back to the first first point there. Have a goal of where you want to be, and and when. Uh, I mentioned earlier that cyber is a vast area. It, 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 it's such a wide profession, um, and there are so many different uh, you know technical and non-technical. Uh, elements to it and roles there so i would i would advise you to gain broad experience before specializing in a particular particular area it's back to the point on the last slide around moving around the it department before before specializing in it it security if you if you've worked on the desktops on the servers on some of the firewalls etc and um, you'll have a better um, knowledge base across the piece you can't be an expert in everything um, Please don't be put off by very technical subjects. Um, you know, if you watch pen testers work and they're sitting in a hoodie and typing away and the screen writing going up the screen at a thousand miles an hour, don't be put off by that. Um, that's, that's a media representation of cyber security. You're part of a team and in any good team, there will be diversity. There'll be technical people, non-technical people, people that are good at risk, and people from all different backgrounds. Um, and, and an agenda gap still exists, uh, unfortunately, um, in our um, profession, as you know, the majority of people in law and indeed the applicants, from my experience, are still male for some reason, despite this being uh, an extremely attractive um, career for the, the reasons I've gone into. So just some examples of things that I would, I would call out as, as technical parts of, of cyber security. Things like threat intelligence, threat hunting, penetration testing, uh, if you specialize in digital forensic, forensics, which is often um, in, in conjunction with law enforcement, network and application security or, or, um, or a SOC analyst, they're, they're typical sort of technical roles. Um, but it is an extremely varied profession and non-technical roles include risk management, that's absolutely key, um, ISO 27001, which, which is a framework for information security, um, development of policies and procedures to say what's acceptable and not acceptable in an organisation. Increasingly important to look at supply chain assurance, um, particularly when uh, suppliers are handling our data or have access to your organisation's networks, so the assurance of them that they're doing their job properly is becoming increasingly important and incident managers, management as well. In different sectors may have different requirements and a focus. So if you work in finance, heavily regulated sector, um, you know, more than one regulator um, and lots, lots of returns and things like that that we need to do. Healthcare is entirely different. Um, a lot of focus on protecting um, confidentiality of patient information, that sort of thing. But if you work across the public and the private sector, you'll see a, a lot of difference. Um, between um, the requirements and, and the budgets and, and how they handle um, cyber security. Um, I think my time's almost up, nearly time for some questions, but just a part and thought, um, as you pursue a career in, in cyber, you'll also be expected to provide free 24 seven support and advice to family and friends for life. And that's if you're not doing that already. So. Um, with that, if I can hand back over to you, Phil, just for any questions that have come up. Well, that was great, Steve. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, I've got loads of questions for you. Um, <laughs> so first of all, um, we're at very strange times at the moment. So how's, how's COVID been for the building society? 
Um, we have been working from home predominantly since between mid and, and, and the end of March. Um, we have um, needed to, to bolster our remote working capabilities from a, from a technology point of view. Um, we, we had those plans in place already, but we were able to expedite the plans um, so that around 90% of the colleagues were working um, from home. Um, they presented us uh, some, some challenges, as, as you would expect, with a rapid deployment of technology. Uh, but I'm pleased to say we've managed to overcome all of those fairly quickly without um, accepting any more risks uh, in the process. So all good news, really. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. So um, it's very interesting, some of the comments that you made. You talked about specialisation, but as a zoologist, I remember that specialisation is the last step before extinction. So... Um, how do you keep? How do you personally keep up to date with all the rapid change in, in what goes on? Um, I think the obvious the obvious one is, is the mainstream media. We look at um, news, uh, BBC Sky, and, and things uh, on a, on a continual basis. Um, because if we, if we get a cyber news story, we tend to get asked questions about it from um, some of our suppliers and, and some of our senior management as well. So you need to have a view if X happens what's our exposure to it and, and, and where are we placed? What's the risk ultimately? Um, there's a number of um, industry news sources and letters which we will receive and, and uh, ingest um, RSS feeds and things like that from um, to keep up to date. Um, being in the financial services space, we've got membership of some, um, some private sort of intelligence sharing groups as well where we're able to um, get quite a high degree of confidence around uh, things that may or may not be happening. So we tend to get very early indication of breaches, uh, not just in the financial space, but right across um, the cyber space. Um, so it, it's a mixture really, Phil. It's, um, it's, it, it, there's no one source of information. It's about building your sources of information and, and, and keeping them up to date. Excellent. So a, a colleague of mine in the police force once said, if you're going to steal anything, steal money, because you can spend it anywhere. So, uh, I presume finance and cyber security are not great bedfellows. Have you seen any change in the threat landscape since uh, COVID? Uh, we've not seen any change in the techniques, PTPs, we, we, we call them, um, that threat actors are using. Um, we've seen a change in the themes, though, um, as you'd expect um, fairly early on in the pandemic. We, um, there was a lot of COVID-themed phishing, um, and you know things like offering um, more information about death rates in a certain country or uh, information about um, vaccines and that sort of thing. So we we saw the theme of the lures changing to to get people to click those links. But in terms of what happened when you followed the, the process through, it was really business as usual and for us in terms of those techniques. So the same, the same back tricks behind the scenes, but different hooks to get you, you pulled in. Yeah. Okay. So then, that, I was going to say we see that as well when when there's a natural disaster or hurricane or something like that, we see the the criminals sort of trying to to take on that as, as a subject. It's anything that's newsworthy, really, which has a, a better chance um, of a click rate. Excellent. But I imagine that the bank is very risk aware and and uh, very very focused on these kinds of all attempted risk on the, on the financial institution. Okay, so um, you totally, you brought this point up about having, uh, don't fall for it, you've got, you need 10 years experience or something that hasn't existed yet for 10 years. And um, so apart from the technical skills, what sort of skills do you look for in um, people that you take on board? One, one of the key things we're looking for is whether the, the, the person will fit into our team. I think it's absolutely essential. You, know, you spend a lot of time uh, at work, um, whether physically or, or, or remotely, and working with your colleagues. So it's essential that, that, that you all get on and that your knowledge complements each other. Um, but I would draw um, back to one of the points on the slide there. Just It was, it was the bottom of the, the first slide, just around those soft skills and how, how, how you conduct yourself, um, how good your written uh, work is and, and you know, it comes back to how you know, politeness and, and all of those sorts of things. So there, there are the, the role specific elements and you can test those fairly easily. It might be with a certification that, that somebody has. It might be with a short test during the interview or, or a number of very um, sort of 
sort of um, closed questions, if you like. Um, but testing those soft skills, I think, is something for the interview. Um, we've not recruited uh, since the pandemic, so all of the interviews that I've done historically have been face-to-face, -face, um, typically with two interviewers, uh, interviewing one person. But, you know, that's obviously going to change um, with, with remote work. And so um, I, think it, I think there's a learning curve both for interviewer and interviewee uh, in that space. Okay, so it's certainly a people industry, yes. And uh, um, so one of the members of the audience has asked, what do you think is the best qualification that, that, you, that people should aim for, particularly entry level? What should people, what would you look for in, in somebody on their technical skills? Um, so, so clearly it's not going to be something like CISP or CISA or CISM, because those are qualifications which are, are further into, you'd expect to attain further into your career. And would look for, for that in a more experienced hire. In terms of an entry level, I think it very much depends on the role. Um, if you go on into to a, to a network and an infrastructure role, perhaps something um, product specific in Cisco or something like that, or Security Plus or, or something like that, um, would be more appropriate. Um, if you're going into a role which is heavily uh, sort of using cloud technologies, um, Look at what the organization uses. Are they, are they focused on AWS? Are they using Microsoft Azure? Both of those providers offer free training and you can take an exam for, for very little money indeed, something like 70 pounds, I think the, the Azure um, uh, fundamentals qualification is. So they're affordable things. And it comes back to what I said uh, in the slide there. You have to invest in yourself and sometimes that's time and sometimes that, that's a little bit of money as well just to differentiate yourself. Excellent, thanks. And uh, final question from me then, uh, you talked about mentoring. And is this something that you still get involved? Do you, do you still have somebody mentor you or coach you? Uh, I, I have a mentor for, for a different reason. Obviously I'm uh, in, a, in a more senior role. So my, my mentor is more around uh, leadership and, and things like that. But within the team we have, um, so I have three early talent uh, roles in my team. Uh, both undergraduate and, and apprentice. So we, we allocated mentors, which were uh, sort of middle layer within the team. So some of my analysts were mentors for the early talent roles, and I was mentors for the analysts, essentially. essentially. So that would, you know, it's, it's just at different levels in, in terms of the way they work. Uh, most of those were on a formal basis, but I found myself um, spending quite a lot of time with um, the undergraduate and our apprentice as well, just demonstrating things. Um, I, I'm from a technical background, so I was able to, to to look at things they were learning on the course and just go through it again and show, show them how it would work on our network and that sort of thing. Uh, we had an undergrad who had a, a real um, interest in pen testing, so that when we brought pen testers on site, we'd sort of ring fence his day so that he could just shadow them and, and watch what they would what, what they were doing that sort of thing so it doesn't always need to be formal i think you need the formal arrangements there because we're all busy and it's easy to say oh, i haven't got time etc so i think you know a mixture of formal and informal works well i've, I've seen it work well for us excellent well thanks so much for that steve i think uh, uh, the other steve may come in and talk about what uh, what he's doing at the durham in terms of uh, mentoring and uh this is to I've got another question, which I'm not going to ask you to answer, but I asked if you could recap the uh, the entry level qualifications. Do you think you could write those down and just email them to me or put them in the chat? Uh, Steve, put, put them in the chat there. No okay, problem. that looks great. All right, well, thank you very much, Steve. That was great. Can I ask Matt to come back again, please? It's possible. I'm back, I think. Matt, how are you? Hello. Uh, I'm fine, how are you? No, I'm good, good, good. Thanks. You don't sound very convincing there, but there you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be two seconds when the presentation comes up and then I'll be more at home. It's that little moment, isn't it, when you think, oh my goodness, it's not going to come up, but there you go. Okay, excellent. Matt, over to you then. Thank you very much. Great. Great. So um, the presentation that I'm going to go over today is entitled Cybersecurity, It's More Than Just Hacking Stuff. Um, so for those of you who are wanting to study cybersecurity, don't worry, we do hack stuff, um, but that's not exclusively what we do. It ties in really nicely, actually, with what Steve said just before me when he's saying how vast an area cyber actually is. So what I'm wanting to talk to you about today is one of the areas that we're covering at the moment that falls under cyber, but it may not be something that you'd ever thought you may end up studying at degree level around cyber security. 
So I'll start off with a quick introduction. So hi, I'm Matt. I'm the Programme Leader for Networking and Cybersecurity degree programmes at Newcastle College University Centre. I did my undergrad studies in ethical hacking and secure system design, and then I did postgraduate studies in cybercrime investigation. So I've kind of got a, you know, both sides of the coin. So we know how to hack into systems and sort of cover your traces, and then equally how to actually catch the people that are doing that and how they get prosecuted and so on. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is one of the new projects that we're just bringing on board for this year um, and something that I'm really excited about and I know the students are excited about so I thought I'd make that the topic of today's talk. So it's all surrounding an area known as open source intelligence, uh, commonly abbreviated to OSINT. So OSINT's a form of <laughs> sort of research almost, where you find information on organisations online. So it's something you may find yourself doing if you were carrying out the reconnaissance parts of an ethical hack or a penetration test. And it's how we can look at websites and database systems, um, things like reverse image searches, looking at metadata potentially, uh, looking at who owns the means of websites, potentially sending emails with what are known as tracking pixels, so we can see when people have opened the emails, um, where they've opened the emails, and we can find all kinds of information around that. So we delivered this as a module last year. Um, I'll go into in a couple of slides time a little bit more detail about how we actually delivered it as a module. But the long and short term, I have a friend who owns a business and we basically use him as an example with his permission. And the students carried out research into his organisation and basically any information that was online that shouldn't have been online or that was maybe going to put the company at risk, the students found and then they put the report together for him at the end and found some pretty interesting stuff. Um, one of the things, for example, he took a picture when he was on holiday um, and in the background of the image there was stuff on the desk and one of the students managed to zoom in and clear up the image a little bit using Photoshop or or CSI would have you believe press the enhance button and then all of a sudden everything was perfect and they managed to find his actual passport number um, for the person who owned the business so I managed to get that information to him and he promptly sort of deleted that information from Facebook. So it was quite good, quite a fun unit, the students enjoyed it but then we got to the end of the module and kind of thought we're learning some really cool skills here, um, could we not be using them to, to better effect? So rather than just looking at this person um, who owns the business and finding the people who work for him and you know where his company is registered, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, could we not be doing something a little bit more um, beneficial with these skills that we're learning? And that brings me to the new partnership that we're going to be working on um, this year, which again is something the students are very much looking forward to, uh, as am I. So there's a charity known as Locate, uh, Locate International. And what they do is they work on finding missing people. So when people have been missing for various amount of times, um, so there's some cases that are going back 50, 60 years, there's some cases that are going back around a year. And there tend to be cases that the police still potentially have open, um, some of the cases which are closed and really where there's no existing leads. So they're known as cold cases. So the leads have gone quiet. They've not really got any information for a little while. Um, the families of the people who are missing are feeling a little bit, well, I suppose how, I'm not sure what it is I'm looking for, but how you might imagine you'd feel if you'd lost a family member and you felt that it wasn't really getting anywhere. So I've been speaking with one of the guys who works at Locate, and what they do is they work with universities and colleges. Um, primarily universities, I think, were the first sort of university centre slash college to get on board with this project. And we combine our skill sets that we've been learning as students with their skill sets as investigators. So there's people working for Locate who are retired policemen, retired investigators, um, some people are actually still very much active in the force and they're doing it from a voluntary basis. And we then combine that skill set with what our students are doing. So the guys who have got the ability to do the investigating, um, find information about cases and so on. And then the guys and girls on the course who can then use their open source intelligence to dig into this kind of stuff, uh, to have a look online, trying to access things from archives potentially about people that may have gone missing or you know, slightly darker but unidentified bodies potentially in areas where people have gone missing and so on looking at those kind of areas 
So there's a couple of examples I've just got on here. Um, these are directed from Locate the Charity, so at this point I'm taking absolutely no credit for the college. We've not had anything to do with this bit yet, um, so I'd just like to make that clear so it doesn't look like I'm trying to you know, ride anyone's coattails. Um, but some of the stuff that we've been looking at, um, or one of the main stories, which you can probably find a bit about if you Google it, is the case of Giorgio and Katrina. And all they had to go on was a body that was washed up on a beach um, and the person was wearing a ring and on the inside of the ring it was um, transcribed something along the lines of to Giorgio from Katrina or it, you know, it may have been the, the reverse. And based just on that information they've been trying to carry out investigations so that had involved looking at things like marriage records in the area where the Giorgio and Katrina that had potentially been married in the area. Um, as you can see on the image on the left um, started looking at shipwrecks and stuff in the area around about that time. Could it potentially be someone who's gone missing from a ship? Can they then use the open source intelligence to get online and find records of the uh, people that have been reported missing from said ships and so on and start trying to build and put a little bit of a case together. Um, and you see it's grabbing a little bit of traction so from the Cornwall live website um, new leads on cases of the unidentified body washing up 40 years ago. This is just one example that I'm giving. Um, the Active Search database literally has thousands of cases on now, um, some involving just missing people, some involving bodies that have potentially turned up and so on. So there are quite literally thousands and thousands of cases. So how this is relevant for our students, um, potentially anyone who's listening who's considering becoming a student, how it would be relevant to you. We approach this in two ways. At level four, our students on the networking and cybersecurity module um, course take a module in open source intelligence, and that's where we cover multiple different techniques. So as I was mentioning earlier, things like domain lookups and reverse image searches and um, Wayback Machine and all kinds of cool websites where you can find this information. For the assessment at level four, students carry it out into the small business that I mentioned earlier. I had considered making the assessment part of what we're doing with Locate, but I decided against it, just thinking we don't necessarily know what students' stories are and so on. And if there was someone in a class who had experienced something like this, they may find it uncomfortable being told, oh, by the way, you're doing this for an assessment. So it's made entirely voluntary. Once students have completed work at level four, if they show an aptitude or an interest for it, they then get an option at level five to put themselves forward to work alongside of the people at Locate. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Locate comprising of professionals who have you know, got a lot, of, a lot of experience in these kind of areas, including some current and former police detectives. One of the great things um, with this partnership is that it's quite literally one of those win-win-win. Everyone who's involved wins. Um, the people who have had family members missing for years get to feel like people are actually looking for them again. Um, the professionals at Locate get a young group of students who are able to put their time and efforts in to help the system and our students are getting the opportunity to get a form of work experience alongside of real world professionals. Um, so it really is beneficial for, for absolutely everyone who's getting on board with this. At the moment, I think we've got about five students who are gonna be doing it this year. This is the pilot year that um, Newcastle College University Centre are participating and there's been five students from level four who have sort of come to me off of their own back and said, yes, I'd like to get involved with this. Um, which is fantastic to see because it's got no bearing on the current year, they're not getting credits for it, they're not getting marks from it, it's just coming from an interest in what they studied in the classroom um, and I like to think wanting to make a little bit of a difference in the world. Um, I think I've done that thing where I talk about everything and then open the next slide and it's got all the stuff that I should have been talking about 10 seconds ago, um, so I'll just recap it. But again, the families of missing people are aware that somebody's still looking for the loved ones. Um, when I say that, I mean no disrespect to police forces. I know that they are still looking for a lot of these cases, but in cases where people have been missing, let's say, 10 years and there's not been any new leads and things dry up, um, it may be that we need this additional push for people to get there and start looking online and you know, unearthing some, some information. 
as we mentioned, students getting real world experience, which is fantastic, exposure to industry professionals, um, access to additional OSINT training materials. Um, so one of the fantastic things that the people over at Locate have offered to do is actually provide some additional training to the students. So when the students sign up to do this, rather than just sort of patting them on the back and saying, right, crack on, they're giving them the additional training, the support, the mentorship um, that they need to help, to help build this up. And an additional thing, I feel it provides an alternative pathway to cyber students. Um, so again, just alluding to what Steve said earlier, with there being so many different areas you can take it, with policing being one of those areas, it's just one of those great things to have on a CV that any of the students who decide that maybe they see their career in forensics or policing or somewhere in that kind of ballpark can go forward and say, well, actually, I've got experience on working on investigations with X and Y and Z, and this is where I did this, and this is where I did this. Uh, so it, it offers that kind of alternative pathway that's, that's slightly different to just the more predefined cyber and networking. I'm going to go into networks and I'm going to go into sort of ethical hacking. I did want to mention a couple of the ethical considerations because when we're going into this partnership, there were all kinds of things that we were having to, to look at um, and consider. Uh, I have mentioned one earlier, which was that we didn't want to say to students, right, as part of your assignment, you're going to be looking for a missing person um, because there are all kinds of things we need to look at. We don't know what students' backstories are and so on. So just a couple of bullet points I put on that may preempt some questions or may set people's mind at rest almost. So the students are going to be working with publicly available information that they attain using OSINT techniques. So they're not going to be working with any restricted information, anything that's only available to police, anything on sort of sensitive databases or you know, anywhere around that. At no point will the students be making direct contact with any third parties during an investigation. Any findings get reported directly to supervisors at Locate, um, which is obviously another big area we, we definitely didn't want students doing things and sort of sending a message to somebody so I said oh, I can't help but notice Sharon went missing around about the time that you moved in next door and you're know, getting into all kinds of issues that we, we wouldn't want to and that's something else is taught um, certain web browsers that you can use that um, keep you anonymous and so on um, it's going to be covered on the modules and it also gets covered by the, the professionals over at Locate. Um, and just to clarify as well, the organisation that the level four students investigate within their assessment, the organisation is fully aware of the investigation that goes on, and completely complicit with it. And at the end of the academic year, the reports get sent through to them um, and it always helps them tighten their security a little. So as I said last year, one of the things was that a member of their staff, um, but the owner of the business, had their passport picture uploaded online or the passport number, I should say. Um, and that person was able to go on and delete that. The final slide before I hand over, or hand back to Steve, um, I'm just going to pop on the screen for a second, just my contact details. So anything that you don't manage to get to in the sort of Q&A, or potentially if there's questions about the courses that we offer in general or so on, um, I've got my email address on there, I've got my LinkedIn address, uh, and anyone who's feeling particularly lazy can just scan the QR code and it'll take you straight to, to LinkedIn. Though in the interest of becoming a cyber security professional, don't scan any QR codes that you're not sure about um, because you don't know where it'll take you. Um, and yes, that's my presentation. So if we can ask Steve to join us again for the Q&A part. Well, credit to me, Phil, uh, that's going to speak too much. But Is it Phil? Sorry, there's so many Steves, I'm just, I lost you. Sorry, Phil. No, no, that's okay. Um, that was really, really uh, interesting. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, Few questions that I've got to ask. First of all, you, you you very much talked about the ethical issues of um, but cyber security. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a question, a very ethically heavy uh, problem, isn't it? So how do you teach students the good and not the bad? You can't. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the answer that we were looking for, but the good and the bad, it's it's the same skill set. Um, so the people who are working in cyber security and they're looking at preventing you know people who are hacking into systems they need to know how people hack into systems so we need to teach sort of the skills um, so I, I, I try and teach them in as much as you don't learn good person and bad person skills 
it's the same set of skills. So I always use a scenario that if you were going to Asda, um, you wouldn't go shopping and ask for a knife to chop the vegetables and then ask for a knife to wave at the neighbours when they're blasting out music at 4am. Um, a, a knife is a knife and how you use it is ultimately going to come down to you as a person. I hope that wasn't from personal experience, by the way, Matt, but there you go. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what I, I found really fascinating about the, the uh, discussion there was the you talked about the Silicate project, which is really putting cybersecurity in a positive way. It's, it's, it's using the tools for good to, to do something really good for people rather than the traditional way of, um, of seeing cybersecurity as defending people from, from bad people. So do, um, it's interesting to see that people are picking this up. Do you expect this to be a, a, a very uh, exciting and very um, t high take up of, of this project for this piece of work? Yeah, I very much hope so. Um, the students, it's been quite a good take up this year. I know when I mentioned earlier there's only been five applications, that might not have sounded earth shattering, but there was only 15 students who took that module last year. Um, so, you know, a third of the class so far have come forward and saying they want to engage in it. I think it's a module that the students have very much enjoyed doing. Um, uh, it's certainly looked that way from the sort of feedback that we've got from the students. So, yeah, they've enjoyed doing it. We've had a good sort of few students coming forward and saying they'd like to do it voluntarily. So I, I very much hope it has a good, a good take up. And then hopefully with this being our first year doing it, of course, the cohort that completes it will be able to feedback their experience to the new cohort um, and sort of explain how it's helped them and what the new skills they've learned is and how it's been working with industry professionals. So we hope it gathers a little bit of traction and becomes a recurring thing, definitely. Okay, so it, it, as you said, it's the same skills, just using them in a different way to solve uh, uh, different problems. Um, earlier on in the presentation, you talked about how you've worked with a company to, to help them to understand the risk that they are facing. And so how does the college keep up to date with what employers, employers are looking for in cybersecurity professionals? Uh, we reach out to them. Um, so the degree that I was just alluding to there, I only wrote it a couple of years ago. So it's just the second year of running this degree and we literally went out to local employers and spoke with them and said you know what are the areas that you feel the graduates are missing what are the areas you'd like them to be working on more um we get that feedback and then you know we'll speak alongside of them and actually start building the qualifications so everything we teach has been influenced by organizations um about what they what they want to be doing um, and we also get live briefs where we can go out, we can speak with people in industry and sort of ask what's a scenario that's happening at the moment um, that your you know, graduates are dealing with. They'll give us the scenario. We'll make slight twists to it, of course, for various reasons. And then that can go out to students as a module guide. So to all intents and purposes, they're working on real world problems that graduates are working on or that they themselves will be working on in a couple of years time when they're out there in industry. Does industry always know what it's looking for? Because it's such a rapidly changing industry. Um, a lot of what industry had mentioned when I was previously speaking to them wasn't actually hugely technical. Um, the main things that they were saying was that students' technical abilities are fine um, and equally sort of saying there's so much free training online and so on that if students' technical side of stuff isn't quite there, they can help you know the student put them through training and get them to the practical side of stuff as well i think the biggest things that they were actually mentioning um was resilience and sort of rolling with the punches almost um so around three or four different companies that i spoke with had said one of the things i'd like us to be building into as qualifications is more troubleshooting because they found that a lot of their graduates when they do something and everything goes to plan it's happy days everyone's happy but as soon as they run into an issue, they maybe didn't have as much of the troubleshooting. So let's dissect the problems and see if we can figure out what's going on as they would like. So three of our modules this year have all got that kind of stuff built in to, you know, not just ask the students to be doing things, but to be giving them things that are already broken and asking how you'd approach fixing this and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, that was the biggest thing that I found when it came to the technical skills that could go into, yes, this is what we need them to know, but their biggest questions uh, or the biggest things that they raised were more about sort of resilience and um, how you deal with things when, when they don't necessarily go to plan. Okay, last, last question then, and uh, 
Does a good student make a good employee? Oh, um, I think it's hard to say because I I see them as the student, and then I guess I never really see them going on as an employee. Um, I would definitely like to think so, but I think there's also other elements that you need to know as well. You could be a fantastic student and be able to do all of your work on time, but if you struggle with timekeeping and working with other people and so on, then I suppose there are elements that, that you may struggle with. The only real scenarios I can think of are a couple of our students who have graduated with us and then come back to the college in some capacity as maybe a learning coach um, to you know, help students who have been doing what they were doing a couple of years ago. Um, Yes. Thank, thank you. you. You mentioned timekeeping. We've actually run out of time for some sessions, so I need to keep okay. in. So thank you very much. And I could um, sorry, bring up Steve and Lee, please. Hi, Phil. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Yeah, I'm good. Good, good. It's like, like the old days. <laughs> <laughs> um, so are you going to kick us off then? And, and Lee will follow up? So, is that the yeah, so we, we're going to do a bit of a, a double act this afternoon. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is give a, a perspective on um, on apprenticeships from the point of view of myself as a, a public sector ICT lifer and uh, Lee's going to do a little bit on um, being a, a cyber security apprentice. So we've got some, some slides to kick us off. Uh, if I can bring those into play. Okay, so I'm Steve Hodgson, uh, Strategic ICT Manager at Durham County Council. So my role in the council is to uh, look after the teams who look after uh, networks, uh, security, uh, hosting, both on premise and in the cloud. I look after the support service uh, and an implementations team who do installation work. We don't just work within the council. Um, we have a commercial services arm uh, who bring in income of around five and a half million pounds per year and they work in mainly schools around the northeast region but also providing services to some of the blue light services so for example every fire station in county durham is connected across durham county council's network the police's anpr systems connect across that network and through regeneration activities we have um, some online businesses people like adam bank who are an online bank they uh, run their services across our infrastructure. So what I'm, I'd like to talk about um, how I got into the business. In the old days uh, I bought my first computer in the early 80s mainly to play games on. Uh, I saved my money from a Saturday job and bought a ZX Spectrum, a Sinclair ZX Spectrum, mainly played games but rapidly got into what computers could do. Um, so from that, uh, I was able to, to kind of learn about programming. And I wrote some games uh, using machine code because the ZX uh, Spectrum wasn't a great, greatly powerful piece of equipment. Um, but I did learn how to program using um, Sinclair Basic, but also a machine language uh, and assembler. And that gives a really good kind of grasp of what... Um, what was involved in developing computer systems from memory management through the uh, managing peripherals, output the screens and that kind of thing. What I really wanted to do though was be a rock star. So when I left school I had nine all levels and a bad haircut and I went to New College in Durham to learn, um, to learn music. I did that for a few years, played in a few bands around Durham, um, but there's not much stability in um, building a career in rock music and I realised that if I wanted to, to kind of get on progress I maybe needed to calm down a bit and get a proper job. Being a rock and roll outlaw I didn't want to go to university so I joined um, a youth opportunities program uh, that was run by the job centre at the time and I went to Derwinside training uh, to do an apprenticeship in computer programming. 
At the time, we were using products like DBase 3 Plus um, and a compiler called Clipper, and we we're mainly writing programs for uh, personal computers, uh, standalone computers. And I was lucky enough to get a job with uh, Downside District Council around about 1990, um, and it was a short contract to develop a bus permit system. And the idea was that um, we'd have a program that was on a, a personal computer which would be taken to community venues around um, the district in, in Derwent side. And uh, people who were eligible for bus passes would go there at a pre-arranged time. The person from finance who was running the system would enter their details and print out a new bus pass system, a new bus pass on a dot matrix printer. All the information would be reconciled at the end of the day and posted back into the finance system. And from the finance system at Derwent side, it was posted to the county council finance system. So it's quite an involved uh, routine. And it took two or three months for myself and a colleague to develop. But it was really great, really enjoyed it. I thought, this is for me, this is really what I want to do. At the time, at the end of the, uh, the short contract, um, a technician role came up within the council. And I applied for the job and I got the job. And it was my first proper job. And we were using, um, going from kind of the old days of uh, Sinclair ZX Spectrums to IBM technology, new Windows technology that was coming out in the mid 90s. And we're moving away from mainframes and green on black screens to uh, Windows systems, networked systems, and personal computers. And for me, it was a, a revelation. It was a whole new, new way of working. There was some great new technology to get involved with. There were some, some odd things to contend with as well. For example, that, that piece of uh, coiled cable on the left-hand side of the screen there is IBM Type 1 cable. And if you've ever come across that, that pitch is a lie because it has the worst bend radius in the world. That stuff just doesn't go around corners. And when you crawl under a desk trying to uh, plug in a new network computer using that stuff, uh, you've got your work cut out. So we use Windows NT to build a uh, small network for architects down at the Front Street Stanley offices. And we link the computers together to a central file server so that the architects could share drones on a new system. As a, an apprentice, effectively, during the, the early time at Derwent side, I got involved with a lot of interesting work. So as well as configuring the mainframe computer, the IBM ES400, which involved memory management, disk allocation, switching real tapes out, all of that kind of stuff that you see on old sci-fi films. Uh, we built um, personal computers. We actually took them to bits and put new network cards in, added memory, uh, figured out how to connect them to networks because it was quite new at the time. We used, um, used a lot of um, new technology in terms of connectivity. So I remember plugging in one of the first modems that we had, which was a, a 9600 board modem, which read 9600 bits per second, which is it's kind of laughable nowadays in terms of, um, of broadband connectivity, but it did the job. It allowed us to connect our systems back to, um, to the county council systems, allowed remote offices, neighbourhood offices to connect back to the council services. I was also involved as an apprentice doing some of the more mundane stuff. We put in a, a new stock control system for the joiner shop stores. I remember one wet um, November weekend in the joiner shop counting lengths of wood. So we'd uh, punch them into the, the new stock control system. So it wasn't all just kind of uh, fancy new computers and new technology. There was some real um, kind of on the ground practical things that I got involved with. And as much as anything, that helped us learn about the business. So why was it important to have an accurate stock control? What did it mean to the guys on the floor when they came to use um, some of the new systems? Uh, and it gives a good grounding in how the business worked and how, how the business operated. I was lucky enough to be involved with a lot of projects. Um, the excerpt from the, um, the, the LGA Rural Conference Guide on the left of the screen there was from 2003. And that was when we were developing broadband networks for communities. Um, Derwent side at the time um, had a big problem with regeneration. 
The steelworks there had closed down in the 1980s and was still hangovers for that in the 1990s. And there was a golden thread of regeneration, uh, which involved ICT. And I was lead on that. Um, and at the time, there was a gap between the kind of rural development of broadband services and the, the stuff that was happening in, in the cities and the urban areas. And it's very similar to what's happening today, 17 years later. We still have that broadband gap and we're still trying to close it. Yeah, at the time we were moving from dial-up to ISDN, whereas now we're moving from maybe 100 meg to gigabit services, but the principles are still the same. There's still that difference between uh, the, the digital haves and the digital have-nots. So I went to Europe, I went to Brussels to um, sit in front of some EU commissioners, asking them for money to uh, develop some of these services. We developed Digital Durham, um, and we're still developing those services today. But having that engagement with uh, pan-European partners, as well as uh, local communities, stood us in good stead for uh, development in the career. So now I'm part of um, the Digital Customer Services Management team at Durham. That pitch is a little old, we've moved on a little bit from there. And I lead a team of 135 people who, as I said, are engaged in a range of disciplines across the council. So why do I think apprenticeships are important? Well, they give an alternative route to, to a career in certainly within ICT and other industries. Uh, it's a route that I took um, and I believe it's a, a really good option for those who do want to take a more academic route uh, into a career. Um, often we bring in apprentices and they're with us for a, the period of the apprenticeship and then move on because we don't have jobs to offer them at the end of that. But that fits with our social responsibilities. If I can train up a person to be uh, skilled and valuable, uh, have a drive to develop themselves, then that, the ripples that that person may create within the industry, certainly within um, their community perhaps, they can uh, help with economic development, they can uh, sustain uh, themselves and perhaps their family uh, once they've developed that career. There's also the succession planning angle from apprenticeships. Within my um, application development team, the average age of 35 staff who are in the team is 40 years. Now that's quite old, uh, no disrespect to, to, <laughs> to older people, but from a, a planning point of view, those people are going to be retiring in maybe 10, 15 years. So I need to be bringing people through the ranks to, to replace them. Uh, and apprenticeships is a really great route to do that. As an apprentice, what did I learn? I learned my craft as an apprentice. So as I said, I was uh, involved in various parts of the business. I didn't just work on uh, ICT stuff. I spent some time on the House and Services help desk. I worked with cashiers. I went out on a refuse wagon one day um, and that all helped me to understand how the business operates, how the work flows, how the money flows, uh, how the customer should be at the heart of everything we do. That helped us develop my craft. I also learned about time. Uh, now time, certainly in local government, is important. So for example, a good illustration of that is we're about to implement uh, a new cyber security vault system, a product that we buy from Dell. And it costs around £350,000 uh, for the size of system that we want. I was specifying that system two and a half years ago, around about this time two and a half years ago, um, because uh, finance uh, capital bids within the council are always done two years in advance. So in terms of timing, you need to understand what the landscape's gonna be in, in two years time, what the technology is gonna be and the business need is gonna be at that time and put together a business case to buy something that's gonna fit that need and satisfy the, uh, the business uh, need at that point. Now that's quite difficult. If you imagine looking back now, can you remember what mobile phone you had two years ago, for example, what model it was, uh, which version of software were you, you were using? which cyber threats existed then and what's emerged since then. Can you even remember what happened before COVID? Because I'm not sure that I can. It seems so long ago. But the main thing I learned from being an apprentice was that ICT is a fun industry to be in. There's lots of opportunity. There's lots of things you can do. I'm still uh, in a similar role in the, in the same organisation, working in ICT. 
um, nearly 30 years later because every day is different. I've been to, as I said, I've been to Brussels. I've stood on the top of Durham County, County Hall with a pair of binoculars trying to work out where the best Wi-Fi connection was going to be. Um, I've unplugged our service from the NHS when WannaCry hit, physically unplugged the network cable. Um, and I've had opportunities to come and talk to, uh, on, on things like Cyberfest. So I'll hand over to Lee. Uh, Lee is our first uh, cybersecurity apprentice. So over the past few years, we've realized that we need to bring cyber skills into the organization. And Lee's our first follow into that, uh, into that area. So I'll hand over to Lee to do some, uh, some of the presentation. All right, I'll just uh, take over the presentation. Okay, so I joined Durham County Council in 2017. It'll have been about October time. And I joined as just a basic level three apprentice. Um, it was just generic IT. There was no specialism there. And in the th first three months of me being there, I worked on the service desk, which is a bit more than asking people if they've turned it off and turned it back on again. Um, it really opened my eyes. Um, it was a really good place to start, dealing with the customer firsthand. Um, you begin to get a good idea of how issues affect them and their work. So that was really beneficial for us. After three months, I moved on to school support. The council, with it being such a big organisation and it's got all the different teams, um, they allow apprentices to move between the different teams. And the benefit of this is you get experience in a, a wide range of roles. So I spent a few weeks in school support after that. Um, so I was going out to, to schools and you know, speaking with the, the teachers and support staff and trying to keep think, keep everything running smoothly for them and the students. And then I moved into technical services. I moved into the hosting security team there. And this is when I kind of realised that Cyber security was, was what I enjoyed it, it's what I wanted to do. I let my mentor know that, you know, I was enjoying my, my three months at, in technical services and the work I was doing. Um, at the time, I was working on a really good project that I enjoyed. So it was arranged for me to stay there in the team that I was in so that I could continue working on the project and, and do, doing what I enjoyed doing, essentially. Um, this was agreed for another three months. It come to the end of that three month and I still didn't want to leave. I was still enjoying what I was doing, enjoying who I was working with. I was getting every, getting on with everybody in my team and I was learning every day. So again, I, I put the request in to, to stay where I was. Um, some of my, my colleagues that I was working with had also said to me, mentor, um, I was, I was doing good work. I was, you know, trying my best and getting involved and stuff like that. So it was agreed that I could stay there for, for longer and basically end up finishing my two-year apprenticeship within that team. So some of the stuff that I was working on, um, firewalls was one, uh, one of the main things that, that I worked on during that time. Um, the firewalls that the council got are a lot more complicated than what they used to be back in the day. They're not uh, just basically allowing traffic in and out of the network. There's lo there's loads of other elements to it. There's the web filtering and the, the proxy server. There's loads of different uh, antivirus and IPS and all kinds of different things, which the firewall does as well. So the firewalls in itself was, was a massive wall. Um, so get, getting involved in that was, was brilliant for me, it gives us experience working with a wide range of different systems and stuff like that. Um, as well as that, we worked on a phishing campaign. So part of part of the issue that we've got and all organisations are the same are phishing attacks on an organisation. Um, might let malware in. Um, could be credential stealing, but there's a range of things that could go wrong if 
if an employee was to to fall for a phishing attack. And as part of that, we like to test the employees, um, see see how they, they they would do. So we rolled out like a phishing a phishing test. So it was uh, through some software that we had, and the idea is to the the employees will get an email and um, that is a efficient email and if they were to click on it whether it was a link or download the attachment or anything like that and um, we would know and um, but they also get uh, like a training video so the purpose of doing that it wasn't really um, it's not a punishment it's, it's nothing like that it's more trying to just educate people on, on what to look for and to make them understand that it, it is something that, that can happen and um, so that was a really good project yeah, I, I really enjoyed working on that and if we look at now, it's even more relevant now, I think, since COVID. We've seen a massive increase on phishing attacks that the firewall's blocking or our mail systems or even a few that have, that have gotten, few, gotten through. So it's something that we continue to do. And, and being an apprentice, it's really good to be able to get involved in that kind of stuff early on. It really helped us develop my, my skills. Um, I was invited to join the digital security team, which is a team within Durham County Council. And it's got members of all, all the different teams. It's somewhere where we can all get together once a week and chat about different projects that are going on within the council and give advice to each other uh, based, based on like security threats and stuff like that. And it's, I think it's a really good, a good idea because there's not, although I was in the, the security team, security, in IT is, is everybody's job. It's not just one team's job. And I think it's something that we've all, we've all got to work together on. So it's really good to see different people's perspectives on, on a particular issue from their their role and, and the experience that they bring. And it highlighted, it, well, it continues to highlight a lot of, a lot of things that our team wouldn't necessarily consider. So again, being, being an apprentice, you, you get the opportunity to get involved in in different kinds kinds of things like this, which you wouldn't necessarily get from from going to a, a college or a university. So after that two years finished, I was managed to progress onto a foundation degree apprenticeship in cybersecurity. So there's, yeah, that's more recent. That was just since October. And I've had a chance to, to, to work on lots of other things since then. For example, I'm going to be working on the, the cyber vault that Steve just mentioned. So I'm getting involved in, in a wide range of different skills, which is helping develop my knowledge on my skills as well. Um, and I think if I go back to what Steve said, uh, Steve, who spoke at the very beginning about having a plan, and um, I think this is this is definitely where I want to be. Um, I'm coming for you, I'm coming for your job, Steve. And I'll just add on as well at the end. Um, cause I did really like, uh, enjoy Steve's presentation at the very beginning um, about the the role in in cybersecurity. I have to agree with ev everything that he said. Really, it's not it's not a nine to five job. It's it's something that's constantly going all the time your learning is like through the roof it never 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 ends um, and it, I know he listed a few resources there was there's two which um, I didn't see listed there which I've used myself and it's try hack me and immersive labs now immersive labs you normally got to pay for but students get access to to it for free so, uh, through their the, the AC email address you should get from their training provider and the thing that I really like about them them platforms is it's a hands-on hands-on experience so there's actual virtual labs which which you go into and tests you on whether it's pen testing it could be digital forensics or malware analysis there's a wide range of things there so i would definitely say if you if you can take advantage of free tri free tri tools like that um it definitely complements your you're in the workforce and to try and give you that practical experience that you might not be getting So that's me done. Back to Phil. Great, Lee. Steve, thank you very much. I um, hope to be able to see me if you could stop sharing your slides. And, um, I think Sophie's going to bring the rest of the people up. So can I just talk to you while we're waiting for those others to come, um, Steve and Lee. Tell us a bit more about this mentoring programme. 
they have going. So within <clears throat> within Durham County Council, um, I, I've believed for a long time that mentoring is uh, is important for for lots of reasons, and it's a for me it's a two way process. So I've been mentored and I've been a mentor. Um, being a mentor um, helps to get a, a a more rounded workforce, in my opinion. So and and it, it gathers that, uh, it's, that that knowledge that's been built over many years. And um, it's generally, it's not the same as um, kind of academic learning in as much as um, it's more the, the kind of softer side of skills or how to um, maybe diffuse a situation or deal with a situation or work your way through uh, a difficult set of circumstances to try and uh, develop a solution. So we purposely set up a, a mentoring scheme uh, for all the employees in the service, it was um, open. It was it wasn't just a kind of a management development uh, uh, mentoring scheme. It was for any and all employees to engage in. And we, as um, strategic managers, half a dozen strategic managers, spent um, two or three hours a week with members of staff going through that um, that mentoring process. I got loads out of it being a mentor learning about staff, learning different perspectives, learning about people, um, the things that they found difficult. has helped me be a, a better communicator, be more empathetic, uh, as well as understanding some of the nuances of stuff that goes on in the workplace that you maybe wouldn't, wouldn't spot and certainly wouldn't spot now in this kind of online virtual uh, office space in, in times of COVID. Excellent. And, and Lee, what about your, how, how's it working for your, from your end? Um, yeah, it's it's good. Um, I'd like to go back to again something that Steve said at, at the very beginning. Um, there's for me, I've got an official mentor um, who is somebody in my team, but I've also got an unofficial mentor who uh, not actually in they work in IT, but they're not actually in the same team as me. Um, and I think having the both sides of that it, it's really beneficial. Uh, I've got somebody that I can go to for stuff that's directly work related, um, whether it's um, just silly stuff like uh, holidays or, or anything like that or I don't know what I do about this situation I'm, I'm stuck with this um, but then on the unofficial side of it I've got somebody I can go to and think right um, I was doing this training last night I've looked at this I didn't quite get it can we go away set something up in the lab c c can you go through this with us so I think having both sides of that it, it is really beneficial excellent excellent well thanks for that and thanks for the presentation those are excellent um, I'd like to just have a few questions that I'd, I'd like to ask uh, people and um, the first one I'm going to start with I'm going to ask you Matt first if you don't mind but that's uh, we've got a problem here all of us are blokes sitting around white blokes as well sitting around this with this uh, uh, talking about cyber security how do we get a greater diversity into this industry are there students coming through Matt who are is it more diverse what you're seeing um it's more diverse than this particular panel, um, perhaps not as diverse as we'd like. Um, I'd say typically if we have 15 students on a cohort, two of those may be girls, um, maybe another two or three year classes been. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it, it's still not a massively diverse area. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what we what we do to to push it further um, so there are initiatives out there so there's things like Athena Swan um, which academic institutions can get in touch um, can work through and you know help try and get more females and so on into these kind of pathways but there just don't seem to be um, and that's at all levels so obviously the college we teach everything from level one up until level six and it, it's the pattern throughout term um, so it's not just the higher education side that I'm in uh, it's quite a recurring pattern that yeah there doesn't seem to be very many coming through. Okay Steve Gilway what, um, what's the, your experience at the, at the building society is it similar? It, it is yeah I think the, the, the applicants that we get for cyber roles mirror what you'd see if you walk into a typical IT department um, you've just hit the nail on the head um, with your with your intro there, it is unfortunately a male dominated profession. Um, I think it's up to us to sell cybersecurity. 
and some of the earlier points I had on my first slide there are the ways in which we do that. It is interesting. There's a lot of demand for those skills, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we need to to dispel the you know the, the myth that this is an extremely technical profession and we all sit there in hoodies, I said it earlier, um, hacking all day. And that's all we do. It's, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and like I say, we're all experienced professionals and it's up to us to sell the profession and to try and close that gap. The skills are there. The, the talent is there. It just needs to be discovered and nurtured. Um, certainly from okay. an applicant point of view, uh, we, we do note a number of um, the number of um, male to female ratio is is dramatic. It, it's, it, it's nowhere near what it should be. Um, I think for our last um, apprent um, undergraduate role, we had around 50 applications. We interviewed six and I think two of the six were girls. And for four lads and the girls both dropped out actually before the interview so we weren't even able to interview which was really okay, disappointing well, okay well, um, other steve steve i'm going to ask you the same sort of question because um do you think it is because people people think of it as a traditional it so sort a of male blogish kind of thing to do that's putting people off um i don't know i think in my experience things are changing so for example I'm part of a management team now, um, and there are three female and two male uh, on the management team. The head of service is female, and it, to be honest, it doesn't make any difference. The, the quality of work, the work ethic, the stuff that gets done, the ideas that are created, uh, the outcomes are, are equally as good, uh, no matter who's on the team. Reflecting on my own teams, um, and this may be something we could look at, or should look at. The support teams are generally 50-50 male-female, so service desk, uh, remote support, field support. But when you get into some of the more um, uh, specialist areas, so for example, the hosting and security team and the networks team of about 36 people, I think there's one female, and the others are range from lads to um geeks to be polite and that's that, that's how it is and try as i might i've just haven't been able to recruit we don't get people applying for the jobs in that area it's not that the jobs necessarily aren't there i must have done 250 interviews recruitments over the past 10 years and we just the the girls who are applying for these jobs it just it, it doesn't happen so we need to figure out a way of making this stuff either more interesting more rewarding um i'm, I'm not sure what but we're doing something wrong i think certainly from a, a kind of at a ground level at an operational level strategically i think that's been developed well but there's something happening um in the the kind of technical areas that are Make this sort of not attractive to, to to women. But there's no reason why this is a, a male uh, role, in your opinion. I don't think so. There's there's not it's it's not kind of there's no physical stuff involved. It's not like you need to be have a particular physique to do this sort of thing. Um, I think the in terms of problem solving, um, some of the ideas we get uh, around the table. Some of the, the good ideas, the things we take forward, come from a mix. Uh, it's not the kind of sole demand of men or women to, to be able to generate ideas. Work ethics, uh, as good. But there's something that, I don't know, that makes geeky IT stuff not attractive to women. Okay, well, let's uh, talk about geeky uh, IT stuff. Let's bring in Lee at this point. And uh, so, Lee, did you... Um, did Working in cybersecurity attractive because of its technical aspects, or was there some other aspect that was of interest to you? I think it's probably the challenge that that I like. Um, the fact that you, you've never learned everything you need to learn. It you kind of always it's, it's ongoing all the time. Um, so th there's always a challenge to look at. I think it's probably that. Um, but I do know when I first started my level three, there was two girls in my class. 
and maybe it's about three or four throughout the whole the whole of their I, I take it the college I was at. And since I've developed onto the foundation degree, there's zero. Yeah, so I, 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 I can see what Steve's saying about when you get into the more specialist areas, there seems to be even less. Okay, so um, there's nothing harder than working with people. Yeah, there's nothing more interesting, I think, but uh, nothing harder than working with people. How do you um, develop your non-technical skills, right? Um, definitely the people that I work with uh, are really, really good and they, they kind of, they make you too. So, for example, when I first started, I didn't like uh, going on the phone. I, I just didn't, um, I just wasn't really a fan of answering the phone. So they kind of, they give you the confidence, they, they put you in a situation where you feel comfortable doing it. And then now it's, it, it's a thing that I do every day and don't think twice about. Um, so definitely the people that you work with is a really key part of that to kind of push you to, to get out your comfort zone a little bit um, but I think it's also understanding that you do need to get out your comfort zone to, to do things that you wouldn't normally do and that's how you develop and better yourself and hopefully get towards the, the goals that you want to reach. Excellent, excellent, thanks. So we're kind of running out of time so I'm just going to ask, I'd like each of you just a, a quick question of um, one piece of advice for people that are wanting to come into cyber security. Uh, Matt could you start please? Yeah, um, don't worry if your background's not in cyber security. Um, so many of the skills are transferable. Um, and again, as Steve, or one of the very many Steve's, um, sort of mentioned earlier, it, there's so many different elements within it. Um, that you know, just if you go through, you, know, you maybe buy into the stereotype of being able to just type thousands of lines of code with your eyes closed and then all of a sudden everything turns green and numbers are flying everywhere and you're a hacker. Um, there's still all kinds of rules within cybersecurity that, that are accessible to so many people. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. And Steve Gilray? I think it would just be to reiterate some of the things that were in, in the slide deck, really. Um, to, to have a goal, to, to, to try and differentiate yourself you know, when, you're, when you're looking for a position um, you're going you're gonna to be a number of one of a number of huge number of applicants potentially so you, so you need you need to stand out um, you know the way the way that applications work often in larger organizations is that the HR teams will sift before the recruitment manager sees those CV so you need to get through onto the recruitment manager's desk or increasingly it's through an online portal uh, these days so, so you need to stand out but also invest in yourself be um make sure your knowledge is up to date there's, there's no excuse um with the internet nowadays for for not having that knowledge and, and invest in that time in your own development to make sure that that you're there and you can answer any question um in an interview situation excellent thanks steve and now the other steve yeah um you don't necessarily need a plan. Harking back to the, the musical days, there are only 13 notes in the chromatic scale. If you learn those well, you can learn to play tunes and you can learn to play new tunes. If you learn to play tunes, you learn to play tunes. And it's difficult to play something different. So learn the, learn the, the trade and be prepared to be flexible. Be prepared to change. Maybe think about your career as a river. It's one of the analogies I've used in the past when mentoring. A river generally has a direction and a, a flow, but you could be becalmed, you could be in the rapids, you could be at the edge of the river in the middle, a boat could go past and cause ripples and waves. But be prepared just to go with the flow at times. Uh, so long as you've got a rough destination in mind where you want to be, you don't actually have to know exactly where to put the paddle in the water, just go with the flow. Excellent. It reminds me of, you know, when, once you've learned to read, it's almost impossible not to read once you see a word, but there you go. So I think in a very, very uh, similar vein. And so, Lee, last word for you. Um, you know, what, what things didn't they tell you at the interview that they wish you'd told you? Um, I would definitely say you've got to put the time into yourself kind of thing. There's, it's not something you can go and learn at college. It's not something that you, you just learn at work make the most of resources that are out there. There's loads and loads of stuff on the internet that you can access um, varying in different levels. And even if you're not 100% certain on what, what it is you want to do, as you go through stuff, you'll, 
you'll kind of think, oh, that was really good. I I'm, I'm, want to try it the next level of that. And you'll jump up and before you know it, you'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be working to where you want to be. Excellent. Right, well, thank you very much. That's it for our sixth Cyberfest event. There are five more throughout the month. So the next one is actually tomorrow morning as part of your Castle Startup Week, where we'll be debating cybercrime as a catalyst for change in the banking sector. I hope to see you there. I'd like to thank all of the speakers, uh, Steve Gilray, Matt Sessions, Steve Hudson, Julie Bradley. I'd also like to thank uh, Newcastle College for their support, Dynamo, Accenture and the Innovation Super Network, as well as Sophie from Beacon House Events for handling all of the tech stuff behind the scenes. And of course, thank you for attending. Remember, September is Cyberfest, and I'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>